That's it for tonight. Thank you for joining us. Lou is back on Monday. And please join Melissa Francis and me on After the Bell weekdays at 4 right here on Fox Business. Good night from New York. Breaking news tonight, that historic meeting is about to take place. You're looking at pictures live from North Korea and South Korea, the border they share, the DMZ. South Korean President Moon Jae-in on his way to the DMZ to meet with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. It will be the first time a North Korean leader has ever stepped foot on South Korean soil. Here now to give me context, perspective. And a warm, warm <clears throat> glance. It's KFI AM 640 radio host and Iraq combat veteran Brian Suits. Welcome back to the show, Suitsy. Warm glance. <laughs> Thank you very much. I feel completely embraced by your kindness. Uh, so let's talk about this meeting. You have these two leaders that have an awful lot on the table. Uh, number one, denuclearizing North Korea. Number two, possibly reunifying the Korean Peninsula. What happens at this meeting? The South Korean goal line here um, is to get North Korea to actually agree to sit down and sign an actual peace agreement to end the armistice. You know, it's been a state of war since June of 1950. Uh, and that is the, for Moon, for President Moon, that's the ultimate brass ring for him, is to come, is to, come to the South Korean people and say, I got a peace treaty out of these guys. Um, for the North Koreans, it's to appear like they're amenable to actually discussion and give and take. Because this is the warm-up, of course. This is the warm-up to the big event um, next week. So it's still very significant, extremely significant, because this is the first time, as you pointed out, that whoever, whichever Kim is in charge of North Korea has ever met the South Korean president. So it, it is a big deal. But for the South Koreans, their expectations are actually very low, very, very low. They are low, but the stakes are incredibly high. So what part does South Korea play in the process of denuclearizing? Because that seems to rest on the shoulders of the United States and President Trump. So what kind of a warm-up meeting is this for that particular question? Um, they might, the North Koreans might ask the South Koreans for a pledge that they will never allow American nuclear weapons on the Korean Peninsula again. Thing is, when we took them off, we already made that pledge. We're not going to re-nuclearize South Korea. But that would be a good, uh, you know, symbolic get if the South Koreans said, we will not allow anybody to uh, nuclearize the South Korean Peninsula. And that would be a de facto way of them saying that they would not ever become a nuclear power. There's been, uh, there's been a lot of talk on the South Korean right wing about, hey, you know what, we need to be like Israel. The only people we can rely on are us. We should probably have a nuclear program. And South Korea can afford it, unlike North Korea, but it wouldn't probably lead to what you might call stability. Uh, yes, it's, it's very interesting because President Moon is much more of a hippie than some of the predecessors who have run <clears throat> South Korea. And he um, has resisted some of the military fortification that the United States has offered, including the, the THAAD anti-missile system. Yeah, Moon is a Korean Special Forces veteran. He, he was a, a career soldier, but he is, he is, when it comes to negotiating with North Korea, he's far more pacifistic, far more liberal, progressive than his predecessors. And he does see a value in giving a lot to the North Koreans. The standard North, South Korean position is don't give them anything. Because they just take it. They, they, it doesn't go two ways. Moon is a guy who believes that Kim Jong-un is a far different guy from his dad or his grandfather. Kim Jong-un, of course, went to high school in Switzerland. He speaks English when he wants to. When, when Dennis Rodman needs another Hennessy, you know, Kim Jong-un <laughs> speaks, uh, speaks English. Um, and they sense that Kim Jong-un is a guy who sees the tide of social media, cultural media. You know, South Korea is dominating Asia, Asian culture right now, TV, music, movies, South Korean uh, products are dominating the Chinese media market, the Japanese media market. Kim Jong-un sees that, and he says, you know what, we can have a piece of that. We've already achieved nuclear parity. We're now a nuclear power. We have uh, an H-bomb, and we have a yeah, missile to he's, send he's, it He's on. like the kid so, in the toy, and uh, he, yeah. he sees whatever he wants, and he'll go ahead and take it, perhaps no longer by force if they do in fact denuclearize. Yeah, we will see. Suit stand by. We're going to come to you in just a little bit. We've got some other pressing foreign policy issues and we will tap into that expansive
brain of yours. First up, though, President Trump going to war, at least a war of words, with former FBI Director James Comey, calling him a criminal. But Comey ain't backing down. He's in for a fight. Just an hour ago, special report anchor Brett Baer interviewed Comey about everything from the Hillary Clinton email investigation to Andrew McCabe's firing. But it's what he said about the information he spilled to a friend to get the special counsel started. That could get James Comey in the most trouble. Watch. At what point were you made aware that... A live look at a history-making meeting. North Koreans and South Koreans meeting on the border. The leader of those two countries, Kim Jong-un, we can see him coming down the steps now, flanked by security and various government appointees surrounding him, ensuring his safety. He's looking very Mauian in that dour black jacket made famous by King Edward VII. And now Brian Suits rejoins me to discuss, look at that confident stride. That is hardly a gouty man. That is a man looking future in the eyes and hoping to reshape it in his image. Brian? Uh, this is a remarkable moment. You know, I can't undersell this. It is really an extraordinary moment. It's a great political victory for President Moon in South Korea. And there's absolutely no way to hide the fact that this is a big victory for Trump. You know, this is, you go back to Clinton sending Jimmy Carter and sending Bill Richardson or sending uh, Madeleine Albright and then Bush putting him on the list, on the S list of the axis of evil mm -hmm. and getting no progress. In fact, speeding up the North Korean nuclear program when he put him on the axis of evil. And then the North Koreans accelerate the program under Obama, perfect it under Trump, get their H-bomb on test number six. Mm -hmm. Now they're prepared to talk. That's... The whole thing, they have a, an American president who's prepared to make things go bang, mm -hmm. and they now have uh, completion of their missile and their warhead test, and so now they feel like, now we can talk. So this is an extraordinary moment, and that's an extraordinary handshake. Yes, absolutely. Uh, hand in hand, the two leaders there, shaking hands, holding hands, discussing things. President Moon obviously looks uh, more like a traditional politi politician as we know in this country, and <clears> Kim <throat> Jong-un looks like a... And moon face see what he just did malice. he yes. just took him by the hand he just took him by the hand and made him step into north korea interesting so they have uh, now they're, straddled now they're, two now countries they're back, back in the South dmz korea. um and now they are and and this meeting by the way uh, loaded with all sorts of symbolism and imagery everything has been um, nailed down to the t every aspect of this meeting uh where they stand what they eat where it takes place, it's all been very, very carefully orchestrated. Yeah, but you know what? I think we just saw an unscripted uh, moment. When, when Kim, you know, turned him around and said, let's step into North Korea, I almost thought it was a kidnapping attempt. But, uh, but it, was a, it was a symbolic step into North Korea for President Moon, the South Korean president, mm -hmm. to set foot in North Korea as he's inviting Kim Jong-un into his country, into South Korea. And now I'm here sorry. they are. Moon, moon stepping into North Korea. I'm sorry. Yes, Moon stepping briefly into North Korea to say that both leaders have been in both countries as a way of perhaps symbolizing that uh, the two could somehow become one. And Brian, as you noted, this is a much bigger victory for President Trump of the United States, uh, notably absent in all of these discussions, China. Yeah, um, China and Russia as well are getting the cold shoulder from North Korea, not from us, but from the North Koreans. Again, China's number one foreign policy goal is not to dominate the South China Sea, it's to prevent a unified Korea. They do not want to see a unified Korea. Kim Jong-un knows that, uh, and President Moon knows that, and there probably is not, a, looking 20 years down the road, there's, there's not going to be a single Korea. There might be a morphing of North Korea, but the idea of North Korea starving for 15 years 
just to give up nuclear weapons with nothing in it for them, mm -hmm. it's off the table. They will not denuclearize in English. They never said that in Korean. Uh, now that they have those weapons, they're not giving them up. Um, even if the United States does what Trump will probably do, which is assure them publicly for the world to hear that we will not initiate an attack on North Korea. For Kim in North Korea, yes. that puts them in kind of an opposition mm -hmm. because they have been on a wartime footing literally since June of 1950. The North Korean people sacrifice food, you know, because supposedly they're on this wartime footing because the Americans are about to invade mm -hmm. them. So he seems prepared to be a guy to accept modernity, maybe a little bit of the Chinese model, um, and, and allow the obviously amazingly industrious Korean people in North Korea to get a piece of uh, what they have in South Korea, maybe except for the boy bands. Interesting. Well, you know, you, there always is room for boy bands. We know that. Uh, and, and you're seeing traditional military uniforms displayed, uh, the confident stride of the two leaders. They look joyful and relaxed as they find some common ground here, uh, you know, that's come out of some very, very turbulent years. And I'm sure they'll both want to take credit for this meeting and what comes of it. It's interesting because we just saw the Olympics in South Korea, and this almost seems like uh, an Olympic delegation of two. Yeah, and, and you know, you can make the argument, I, I would agree with it, that this couldn't have happened without extending a hand, a hand to the North Koreans and allowing them, you know, to send that laughable delegation of athletes uh, to South Korea, but it satisfied North Korean pride. You know, they got to participate in this great Olympic event that they saw fellow Koreans uh, holding. So they got to do that. They were treated as equals. The South Koreans didn't mock them. They didn't mock how horrible their downhill skiers were. Uh, you know, they, they treated them like equals. Yes. And so, uh, you know, you could say that that maybe sort of set this up. As odd as it seems, these little things um, like uh, you know, Kim being an NBA fan, mm -hmm. Kim taking Trump seriously, Kim not being rebuffed on the Olympics, that, that these set this up. Yes, and, and the Olympics, you know, that certainly could be the impetus. Uh, it, something that may seem minor that could be the one thing that has uh, a lasting impact on these talks and peace in the future going forward, because this has been one of the global hotspots. This has been one of the least stable elements in the world, North Korea. Yeah. And, and now we're seeing a legitimization of and, and North Korea at the hands of the United States and South Korea. Go ahead. Yeah, and people don't understand that. This is not a communist country uh, like we were used to in, in, in the Cold War. This is a theocracy. He is a god king. Uh, he's a third generation god king. This is a personality driven country. And uh, the, the men in those stark uniforms with the medals from mm -hmm. here to here, yes. uh, they, they owe their positions to him. Um, uh, his whim of, okay, we've achieved nuclear parity with uh, uh, seven other nations on Earth. Um, now I want to pivot another way. Either he goes back to Pyongyang and there's a coup, or North Korea uh, adopts minor bits of capitalism uh, in, with a religious fervor that we haven't seen since East Germany. Mm -hmm. That is the national anthem of South Korea that we're hearing right now. Uh, so, Brian, let's let's draw some parallels between uh, the reunification of Germany, perhaps, and you know, is there a, a separation between East and West Germany, the Germany that we knew in the 80s and as children, uh, versus what we know today? And could we see something like that on the Korean Peninsula? That's, that's the thing. The gap between East Germany and West Germany was far more narrow uh, because when, when the Russians overran and occupied East Germany, the, you know, it, they didn't make it year zero, and they didn't absolutely change the language, and they didn't install a god king or anything. The North Korean people have been under this uh, unrelenting, steady diet of, of mind-numbing propaganda with a security apparatus backing it up that really is unmatched on the face of the earth. The East Germans had cameras and mics everywhere. They were pikers compared to the North Koreans. And so the integration of the North Koreans into a larger, you know, capitalist, market-based, democratic country would be a major muscle movement. And probably both sides know that it would take a generation or two. They're still working it out, you know, 
in Rostock, in the yeah. eastern part of Leipzig, in, in eastern Germany. Um, but the main thing is, uh, politically, the Chinese wouldn't loan a dime to either, to a unified uh, Korea. They would loan money to a North Korea that maintained a semblance of a Chinese-style central committee running an economy. They will not ever accept another free market country full of Koreans. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting, the, the threat that poses to China? Uh, but what's also interesting is you talk about this and you talk about a theocracy. If this experiment is successful, and I truly hope that it is, is there some way of shifting this paradigm to the Middle East, particularly in Iran, where, you know, we assume that those theocratic authoritarians have such a stranglehold on politics and culture and the economy that there's no way they will open up. Are there some lessons we can learn from this and apply over there? Well, this is part of the unspoken message to Iran. What, what Trump is delivering to North Korea is, hey, if you deal with me um, wide open on a, a, on a blank slate here, open table, I give you some, you give me some, you will be welcomed in the, in the uh, community of nations as a full partner and you can start playing by the rules and you can now enrich yourselves and make cars and telephones and whole thing and and we are fair brokers We're, we'll deal with people who will deal with us honestly yes. the the message then to iran is see how we are with the good guys and i mean when you turn north korea into the good guys you know you, you talk about an abc after school special you know it's it's north korea are the good guys yeah. the iranians are supposed to be watching this saying okay what are the Americans going to do? Yeah, what is and happening here? And it's, it's that, that element of predictability that, that may be the North most Korea. successful. Uh, yeah. we're, we're going to listen in here for just a bit. And all we can do is point at the pointing and say, my goodness, this, uh, this really has the potential of being quite historic. Can you and, and you'll notice that Kim, you'll notice that Kim Jong-un is down there without a huge security detail. He probably has some plainclothes guys, you know, the really skinny guys are probably his, but he's not down there with some huge entourage. No, he's not. It's, uh, it's quite out in the open, uncharacteristic. Um, so the party panel is back. Katie Pavlich, Joe DeVito, Kat Tim. Katie, I want to ask you, when the president meets with Kim Jong-un, do you think we'll see this kind of uh, a public celebration? Will will it be mm, this I, I think for the first visible. meeting, we'll see. I think the president and the White House are, you know, they're excited about the prospects of the situation, that things are moving forward. This is a huge, massive step to see Kim Jong-un willing to walk into South Korea to have this meeting. Um, he's probably a little bit nervous because, as we've heard, uh, he, one of his biggest concerns is, is assassination. That's not something that they've talked about. Um, but I think the president will probably have a, a meeting that does not have so much fanfare uh, for the sake of letting the North Koreans know that this is not a done deal. They've talked about the maximum pressure campaign that they are going to continue on North Koreans until they can guarantee that the things yes, that they've been saying lessons learned the from, from past administrations. Denuclearization that they actually yeah. follow through on. So there's a long way to go. So I, I don't predict that the White House would do a big event like this, but I do expect them to release photos of the meeting. Yes, and, and it is a, a series of steps uh, taking us uh, into the great unknown Joe DeVito, but the president's detractors when he was being um, you know, using inflammatory language to describe Kim Jong-un, mm -hmm. calling him little rocket man, and talking about fire and fury, uh, there was a lot of hysteria saying that the president was taking us to the brink of World War III by poking the hornet's nest in Pyongyang. But now, this is uh, another step on the journey to peace. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Well, I still got 10 bucks saying Kim defects while he's there. He just makes a run for it. <laughs> he can't pass up this opportunity. Um, he's no, well, the only well-fed person. <laughs> no, he's he's really well-fed. Well he's going to waddle his way to freedom. Uh, I think this shows that these, as uncouth and as belligerent as Trump can seem, this is what works with the rest of the world. And they saw Obama as a wuss who could be walked all over. And that now they see, oh, yeah. it doesn't and work it, that You way. know, the contrast may show that Obama actually made the world a little bit less safe 
Five seconds, cat temp. Sum it up, babe. You're bringing I, it home. I'm someone who was a little weirded out by him calling him Little Rocket Man and all that kind mm -hmm. of language, but I can completely admit that it seems like it's working, so you have to give him credit where it's due. Yes, and, and hopefully this is a successful meeting that leads to an even more successful meeting. We'll be right back. Stay